Are you struggling to conceive? You have options, and at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, we'll make sure you have the guidance and support you need. Preg is known for individualized fertility care that's unique to every patient. We take the time to provide a reassuring and empowering experience because we believe that you deserve nothing less. Let us help you on your journey to parenthood. Visit us at pregonline.com to learn more. Get the guidance and support you need at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group. Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan, but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. It's your family. It's your choice. First Choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com slash renew to learn more. December 23rd, 1975. These top stories, Najari out, Morgenthau in as the special state prosecutor. United States Embassy staff official murdered by gunman in Athens. This is Lester Smith reporting. Next news as it happens. Next scheduled news at 11 o'clock. Over WOR Radio 710, the talk of New York. Engineer. The passengers were a mixed up crew. 
Christian churchman, atheist, Baptist, Jew. Oh, the rich in broadcloth, the poor in rags, handsome girls and wrinkled hags, black men, yellow, red and white, chained together. It was a fearful sight in the hell-bound train. The train rushed on at an awful pace, and sulfur fumes burned hand and face. Wilder and wilder, the country grew faster and faster, the engine flew. thunder crashed. Whiter and brighter lightning flashed. And hotter still the air became, till clothes were burned from each shrinking frame. Then came a fearful ear-splitting yell. Yelled Satan, the engineer. Gentlemen, gentlemen, gents, the next stop is hell. <laughs> the next stop is hell. Twas then that the passengers shrieked with pain and begged the devil, please, please, they begged the devil to stop the train. <laughs> He shrieked and roared <laughs> and groaned with, groaned and screamed and snickered with glee. <laughs> and he mocked and laughed at their misery. <laughs> My friends, you bought your seats on this road. You bought your seats and you've got to go through. And I'm going to go through with the complete load. You bullied the weak. <laughs> you cheated the poor. <laughs> yes, and the starving tramp you've turned from the door. You've laid up gold until your purse is bust. <laughs> and you've given play to your deadly lust. <laughs> yes, and you've mocked at God in your hellborn pride. <laughs> <laughs> you cheated, ah! and you blundered, and you lied. You double-crossed men, and you're, you're swearing, and you're, you're, look at you all, you're riding on the floor now. You stole, not one of you has perjured his body and his soul. You have paid full fare. You paid your fare to hell, and I'll carry you through. <laughs> tell you there's not one of you don't belong. You're going down there where the flames roar. And the molten lava pours through your body. <laughs> oh, your flesh will scorch in the flames that roar. You'll sizzle. You'll sizzle and scorch from line to core. <laughs> And then suddenly, 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 the cowboy awoke. Oh, 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 oh. The cowboy awoke with a thrilling cry. Oh. He lay on the floor in the bar room. Oh, and his clothes were wet. Oh, oh, my God Almighty. And his hair stood high. He lay on the bar room floor. Ah, oh. And then he prayed as he never had until that hour to be saved from hell and the devil's power. Oh, oh. Oh, give me a little of that theme, Joe. That begin and open and theme. A little of that theme. We'll set that cowboy on his way. Oh, he prayed as he never had until that hour. Yes, that one. What one do you expect? Oh, oh. 
He was saved from hell and the devil's power. His prayers and his vows were not in vain. For that cowboy he paid never again did he pay a fare on that hellbound train. bottle of Johnny Walker in one hand and your bottle of Jim Beam in the other. And you paid your fare on that hellbound train, friend. You bought your ticket fair and square. You'll be there with all the other sinners from all over the world. After all, you're blaspheming and swearing and grubbing for gold. sinful pride that made you buy that Tony Martin Elizabethan double stretch suit. You'll be riding that hellbound train. And Satan himself will be at the throttle. And he'll be blowing that whistle. He'll be blowing that whistle. And it'll echo from canyon wall to canyon wall. It's the hellbound train. And you will be aboard. You paid your way and you bought your fare and you got your ticket. Did you tonight, huh? You didn't expect that. Ah, oh, yes, we're going to have a lot of sins to answer for, which reminds me, this is W.O.R. in New York. And speaking of sins, did you like the uh, Hellbomb train gang? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's pretty heavy stuff. I mean, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you know why I like that piece? That has to plays a very important role in my life. And yes, it does. Uh, as a matter of fact, and the reason I did it uh, during this holiday season was because. <laughs> did you ever? Did you ever have a teacher who uh, who really was hung on uh, on recitations? No, I mean getting up and and reciting a poem. Did you ever have a teacher that that made you learn a poem and you'd have to get up and and give the poem. Well, you were very fortunate. Uh, this, this is, since this has never happened to you, I don't know what kind of school you went to, but almost everybody at one point or other in their school life has had to read poems in their school. And, uh, well, of course, when you go to sheet metal school, that's different. So, uh, sheet metal and soldering <laughs> high school. But, uh, well, we, we, uh, we had this teacher, see, and her, her name was, uh, uh, it doesn't matter, but uh, I'll tell you what it was anyway. It was Miss Nelson. I, I don't like to use that name because she, 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 you know, even now I get a funny feeling in the back of the neck from Miss Nelson. 
But Miss Nelson was the kind of lady who believed that she basically was an artist. You know, there's a certain kind of teacher who feel that if their career or if their father hadn't been so rotten or if they hadn't met a guy named Frank at a certain point in their life, they would have gone on to become a famous Broadway star or they would have written magnificent uh, short stories for Harper's and uh, they would have become a lady novelist. Well, Miss Nelson was that kind. She always took her vacations uh, to uh, what she considered exotic places. Like uh, she took a vacation to Mexico and we heard about it for a whole year as she showed us her slides from Mexico, and she was always bringing in her Mexican jewelry. <laughs> you know that kind of teacher, right? Well, this teacher was so artistic that, that she wove her own burlap skirts, and she was always putting on uh, uh, student uh, theatricals of one kind or another. She was always in charge of the play, the play, Miss Nelson, and she, she made her own uh, uh, bracelets, with great big, uh, fat, heavy-looking things made out of clay, like with the owl faces painted on them, and they clank. And uh, she was that kind of lady. She wore earrings. And very artistic lady. And so Miss Nelson, one year, she was an eighth-grade teacher, uh, Miss Nelson loved to have kids recite because she always thought of herself as basically a kind of a, a kind of a Hitchcock too. She could direct. She's a very good director. And so about two weeks before. Christmas, uh, Miss Nelson said, uh, she says, now class, she said, I want all of you to pick something uh, to come in with, and I want you to recite. And uh, she says, I, and I want you to really rehearse this, and much of your grade this year is going to determ be determined by how well you do this. Now, uh, learning poetry is not important, but self-discipline, boys and girls, is. And the discipline that it takes to learn a long poem is something that will stay with you the rest of your life. So pick a poem, and it must be at least three to four pages long. And you can pick it out of the standard uh, poetry anthologies which you will find in the library. And bring it in. When your time comes, I want you to get up in front of the class and recite it. Oh, God, did I hate that. I'm... The I mean, some people love to get up in front of the class and, and, and talk about the fun that I had on my vacation. You know, that kind of stuff. I hated it. Oh, did I hate it? And I could not learn poetry. I, I could not. I used to hit my head actually physically against the wall. I couldn't learn poetry. <laughs> and I hated it. I really hated it. And so we had these books full of poems like uh, The Boy Stood on the Burning Deck. You remember that? That's a great one. Uh, I tear down her tattered ensign, or I long may it wave on high, uh, stuff like that. And and, and the great poems like uh, Maud Adams. Did you ever read Maud Adams as a kid? You didn't. I don't know what kind of schools you guys went to. Uh, <laughs> you certainly must have read uh, Silas Marner and The Lady of the Lake. Uh, yes, you did. You read Ivanhoe. Of course you did. Uh, what did you read in your class? I'm just curious what you read as a book in your in your school. Well, uh, <laughs> among other things, uh, we, I, I, we spent an entire month in Miss Nelson's class reading Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, that book may have been before your time. They probably didn't have that when you went to school. Midsummer Night's Dream. You remember it was by this guy named, uh, oh, uh, something, a spear, shake, something like that. And uh, he wrote about this, yeah, he wrote about all these people running around in the woods. And uh, there was this guy named Puck. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of ribald remarks about him. I can remember Flick uh, coming up with another name for him. And, uh, yes, and the... Uh, well, what, what was it? Well, for those of you that are Shakespeare fans, uh, I'd be glad to send it to you, but you must. Uh, it'll be sent to you on plain brown wrapper. But it was a typical flick uh, bit of humor. And there were other people who, who <laughs> we couldn't figure out what this had to do with hockey, this, uh, this particular story. But then there was a part in it uh, where these guys went out into the woods, and they met these three people. There were three people putting on a play. And uh, one of them was named Bottom. Do you remember Bottom? And the bottom had this donkey's head, 
on his, uh, yeah, he wore this donkey, he says, and bought him, and there was another guy in there named Tinker. Remember the Tinker? What was the third one, class? All right, class, raise your hand if you know. Uh-huh. Well, I can see we're still among the literati here, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, what was the name of the, uh, what was the name of the fairy princess in that, uh, that production there called uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream? Right, right. Uh, she had a boat named after her that later sank. Right, Titania. Right, do you recall that? The sinking of the Titania? All of you remember that. How many of you remember Oberon? Oh, of course. Raise your hands, gang. You remember Oberon? Remember her? She played in Wuthering Heights with Burgess Meredith. And uh, that was Merle Oberon, if you recall the first name there. She had these dark eyes, kind of a big, wide mouth there, looked mysterious all the time. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Miss Nelson <laughs> had this thing on, on Midsummer Night's Dream, so we had to we had to pick a scene uh, to play, and uh, that was one of her, her big things. See, each one of us had to pick a scene out of Midsummer Night's Dream, and we had to play it. So me and Flick and Bruner got together, and the three of us did the scene where uh, these these three guys came out and did this play. Right, uh, Tinker. And the bottom, and who was the third one, class? There were three of them. No, he was not a TV repairman. See, tinker means a person who makes tin. He, he tink, you know, he's a tinker. He, he, uh, he fixes pots and pans. See, these were, these were three a tradesmen who were out in the woods there, and they decided to do this buffoonery and have this little play they did. And uh, bottom, what was bottom's profession? Raise your hand, fellas. He did what? Waved his hand? No, no, that's not what he did for a living. What did Bottom do? Well, he was a carpenter? Well, uh, that's good enough for Jazz. That's good enough for Darianne. And uh, he he, uh, he wore, in, in the play, what did he wear? Uh, what? A fireman's hat? You're close. Uh, he wore a Groucho Marx face? With the rubber nose and the black eyes? No, you're, you're getting closer. What did he wear? All right, class. He wore a donkey's head. Right. That's correct, Emma. Well, that is the part that I played. That was one of the very first, uh, one of the very first dramatic uh, performances that ever saw Shepard trod uh, upon the, the sacred board. And uh, it's not every kid that makes his debut in Shakespeare. Of course, I don't have to. I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to include uh, as my real debut was a uh, fantastic performance I did in an oral hygiene pageant, which was done in second grade. And uh, yes, uh, Dawn Strickland played a toothbrush, and uh, I was fantastically in love with. Can you imagine being in love with a girl named Dawn? And uh, yes, and I'll tell you, she she turned out to be really something. Really, in later life, she wound up marrying a count or something, but. Uh, you know, we in the second grade did not know that this was about to occur, but Dawn Strickland played a toothbrush. And uh, guess what I played, gang? No, I did not play a toothpaste. All good things were played by girls in Miss Shields' class. A girl played a tube of Ipana for the smile of beauty. And no, I played an impacted wisdom tooth. And... Uh, well, that's what I played. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, all my life I've been getting the tough roles. I, it's uh, anybody can play something uh, goody two shoes like a toothbrush, but you try playing a, a an impacted wisdom tooth and get laughs, buddy. Uh, that's not easy. So I came out and and uh, Miss Shields made these tooth costumes. We had the, they were made out of muslin. Did you ever uh, you know what muslin is? That's one of those religious sects, right? No, 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 no. No, no, that's that's uh, no, 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 no. The Muslims is not the, the this. That's another thing entirely. Although you're close, uh, Muslim is like cheesecloth, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a crummy looking uh, white uh, sort of a frizzly uh, cloth. And she made tooth costumes. Now I had this this fantastic tooth hanging on me, and she ma she used wires. See inside, she covered it with the with the cloth, and uh, inside I had two little peepholes. And I could look out. And uh, down at the bottom, they had this big, uh, it was actually a cavity. They had a cavity painted on it. It looked pretty bad. 
And uh, <laughs> I remember my, I still remember my role. But, but actually, see, I don't like to consider that my debut. Because when people come and interview you, you know, about when did you get started in showbiz, and you say, well, I played this impacted wisdom tooth, uh, it just doesn't look good in queue, places like that. So what I generally do when people ask me, I say, well, my, I made my debut in Shakespeare, my first performance, uh, actually on the boards, and the serious work was in uh, Shakespeare. I played uh, the role of Bottom in, uh, in The Midsummer Night's Dream. Well, that was, you know, that was the kind of thing we did in school, and I, and I very early in school, because of this, uh, well, I'll tell you why I, I grew to hate Shakespeare, as a matter of fact. Uh, many people love Shakespeare. Others hate Shakespeare for various reasons. Uh, the most common is it's largely unintelligible, the way it is performed generally. Uh, people have sat through entire weeks of Shakespeare and not understood a single word that came off the stage. Uh, <laughs> and, and, of course, one of the reasons is that Shakespeare is delivered in what is called standard speech, uh, standard American speech or standard English speech. So, up on stage, you hear somebody say, What you, 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 and you, you know, everybody will applaud, and uh, he's dressed as a count or something, and you won't. And, and then you'll hear somebody say something like this, I say, for sooth, my lord. And they go on like this for hours, and it isn't quite the same thing that Robert Redford does. And uh, so it's very confusing to an American audience, which has basically an attention span of about that of your average uh, field mouse. The attention span of the average American is maybe 15 or 20 milliseconds. And you have to have a little attention there. You're not going to get Shakespeare. Now, the reason I, I personally find Shakespeare kind of dull is because of that damn donkey head. Uh, see, at that time, I had an open mind about Shakespeare. And uh, Miss, uh, Miss Nelson was reading into it, and so she was always reading. And she'd, she'd read him in different voices. And so she would say, Oh, Titania, queen of the night, Oh, come upon thy silver elfin wings. And play us upon thy loop, you know. And then she would she would do different voices like that. So she was really into it, and her Mexican beads would rattle, and her burlap skirt would rustle, and uh, you know that was to me all art. You know, this teacher, Miss Nelson, who was always showing us slides of her visit to Acapulco, and uh, she made her own. Uh, yeah, she made her own shoes out of uh, out of old used general tires. She'd cut them up, you know, with the rubber thongs and all that and stuff. She was really into the peasant bag. What that had to do with Shakespeare, I have no idea, but that type of person, you know, they lump all art together, you know, it's, the, it's all a big ball of wax, and it's the thing you give lectures on. So, <laughs> the day that she had that, that uh, sudden inspiration, she says, boys and girls, all of you will select a, uh, a scene now, just a scene, out of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and the, just before Christmas, we will all give our version of our scenes, and you'll all be graded on it. So I'm going home, you know, with Schwartz. And I said, what do you want to do with Schwartz? The heck, you know? Well, of course, every every kid in the class wanted to do Puck. You know, this is a big, you know, Mickey Rooney played Puck. And uh, everybody wanted to do this, you know, where you sit up in the tree and make smart remarks is what basically Puck did. And everybody in our school felt like they were philosophically sitting up a tree making smart remarks. So we decided, you know, on the halfway home, I says, I'll tell you, why don't we get Flick, and um, I'll, we'll, we'll do this thing in the, in the woods there. Well, it all took place in the woods. Remember that? It was all in the woods. And Miss Nelson had decorated the front of our class to look like what she considered a Mexican-style uh, <laughs> Shakespearean magic fairyland woods, which meant that she got a lot of burlap painted green and hung up with marachis. And, well, yeah, she was in her Mexican bag. You know, people get into that. And, uh, you know, she hung up with marachis and chili beans and stuff, and it was the magic woods. And, and, and so Schwartz, Schwartz and I had flicked. We made a grotto. <laughs> well, see, this whole scene between Bottom and Tinker and Class, what was the third one? Now, come on, Class. That was the role that, uh, that Flick played to such resounding success. Come on, Class, please. We all know who Bottom was. We all know who Tinker was. Who was the third one? There were three of those buffoons. Right. Well, all right, we'll let you worry about that class. And the three of us then decided we had to do it in costume. See, Miss, 
Smith uh, Nelson, being a very much of a, uh, a literalist, uh, demanded that all of us produce a costume as part of our thing. And uh, we were going to be graded on neatness and aptness of thought and uh, various other things. And so <laughs> I went all the up. You know, I, I, it's not easy to make a donkey's head. And uh, the way Schwartz uh, played the tinker was kind of great. See, we had just been reading uh, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, was a big thing in our class, too. And if you remember, there was a guy in that, class, in that story that was made out of tin. Correct. And what was his name, friend? What was his name? The Tin Woodsman. Right. Now, all of you remember the Tin Woodsman uh, had trouble. It, it, what was his trouble? No, 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 no. That is correct. He was rusty. That's what was his trouble. And he stood in the woods for a long time there. He was chopping away. Now, how did he get like that, class? Any of you remember how he got to be a tin woodsman? How he got to be a tin woodsman. Now, this gets a little difficult because we're getting into some advanced theology here. How did he get to be a tin woodsman? Well, I'll tell you, friends. He was a, a regular woodsman before. But as he would chop away, you know, it's dangerous chopping wood. And chop by chop, he would, like he chopped his leg one time, and they wound up putting, giving him a tin leg. And then, it, yes, I'm sorry, friends, you're going to have to face the reality of these fairy tales. He chopped his other leg, and they gave him a tin leg, and he wound up, he kept, you know, doing this wood chopping. He was obviously a very inept wood chopper. He wound up being made entirely out of tin, even his head. Now, uh... <laughs> He had tin ears, even. That's where the expression came from. Tin ear, you've heard it. Well, all right. He had a tin foot, and he had a tin head, he had a tin neck, he had a tin ear, and all that. Now, question. Now, he had, he lacked one thing. That is correct. He lacked a heart, like so many of us. And uh, if you recall, he joined Dorothy on that long trail to search out the Wizard of Oz because, you know, they figured that uh, this is where you got to, you know, he, this guy could pass a miracle, he'd get a heart. And so he joined the group. Now, before he did that, how did they get him, uh, you know, how did, uh, how did they, they came upon him in the woods? Right. They gave him a couple of shots with three-in-one oil, and the next thing you know, he's in business. He had gotten caught in a rain. Now, uh, uh, why I brought this up was because we were very much influenced by the Tim Woodsman at that point, and Schwartz, figuring this is a tinker, tin, you couldn't you get the connection there, Schwartz's costume consisted of a large funnel on the top of his head. Now, that ain't a bad idea. He put a funnel on the top of his head, and he had holes that he made in it with, a, with an ice pick, and he put, the, he put a rubber band in it, and it stayed on his head. He just went under his chin. <laughs> and at that point... See, he's a tinker, see, and uh, that was a pretty fair costume, especially since he took his jacket, he had a jacket, and he covered it with tinfoil, okay, uh, which he took out of Hershey bars. Uh, for those of you who are interested where a kid would get tinfoil, I'd say, you know, Reynolds wrap was not as common as it is now, and a kid had to eat a hell of a lot of Hershey bars to cover it, and Schwartz did. You know, Schwartz was short and fat, weighed 200, maybe 300 pounds, maybe three feet, three and a half feet tall. And so uh, he was into Hershey bars big, especially Mr. Good bars. Now, that's uh, not the same bar, but the, he used to vary those, especially on Sunday. He'd have a Mr. Good bar. His daily working bar was the plain, ordinary Hershey. So on the day of the great uh, performance, which was Christmas time, just before Christmas, I had made my head, the head that I had, which was the donkey's head, I made my head out of a false face. You know, you, you know, I had a false face. You know what a false face is. That's what most of us wear perpetually. But uh, I had this false face, see? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it was uh, just a plain false face. But my mother said, I'll help you make this donkey head. So she took newspapers and she made them wet. You know how they make papers wet and they molded it. And I wound up with this great big 17-pound donkey's head, which was painted brown. And it had big newspaper ears sticking up out at the top of it. And it was because of that donkey head and that donkey head alone that I developed a lifelong and completely deserved aversion to Shakespeare. Why? Well, first of all, halfway through the first scene, I began to suffocate. I don't know whether you've ever tried to 
breathe through seven pounds of melted newspaper to an old used false face. Uh, and I could hear Schwartz faintly through my, through my donkey head saying his lines. Oh, bottom! Oh, bottom! Thou hast have come upon this glade wearing thy donkey's head. Hee-haw! Hee-haw! Oh, bottom! Well, all words to that effect. And, that, and that, at that point, I had a cue. My cue was to go, hee-haw! Hee-haw! Ho! We play upon the stage of life. Hee-haw! We are... See, I still remember some of those lines with loathing. And uh, so, <laughs> halfway through our great scene, the flick came out playing the third character, and he got a fantastic ovation uh, just from his costume alone. And what was that character, class? Well, that'll be your homework for tonight, class. Well, Flick got this fantastic ovation, and halfway through the scene, Miss Nelson stopped me and Schwartz and Flick and said she'd heard enough. The way she put it was, that's quite enough. Well, and why was that? Well, because Flick inadvertently had created a costume that was unbelievably erotic in content. And only Miss Nelson, since she spent a lot of time in Mexico taking pictures with her instamatic and bringing back slides and making burlap skirts, she instantly recognized the erotica in Flick's costume. It was a highly unusual version of Shakespeare. As a matter of fact, if this were to appear on Broadway today, it would be a smash hit. It was the first, well, I can really say it, the first purely pornographic Shakespeare done in the Warren G. Harding School. Halfway through the scene, Miss Nelson merely said, that we've had quite enough. Now, we've had quite enough. Thank you very much. Now, Helen Weathers, you say that you... She just completely tried to ignore it, but the class was agog. It became a legend. There are folk singers out in northern Indiana who still sing of the legend of Bottom. The Tinker Ann? No, he was not a dentist. Although that's a nice try. An orthodontist? A group therapist? No, no. What was it he did for a living? Was he a ship candler? What the hell is a ship candler? <laughs> ah, yes. Art, Shakespeare, Christmas, it's all intertwined. Uh, this is WOR New York. Stay tuned for In Conversation. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, guys. It is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun, too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chum. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.